It's time for the moment you've been waiting for! Alright, 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 easy there. It's not that big of a deal. I mean, it's just the final installment to my genetic miniseries. Actually, it's a pretty damn big deal. Holy shit! Welcome guys to the finale of my genetic mini-series. Now, those of you guys joining us for the first time, fortunately because I have a somewhat unhealthy relationship or obsession is a better term for numbers, I have took it upon myself to come up with a quantitative model of estimating simply on a score of 0 to 100 how good your genetics are. And that is exactly what we've been covering in previous episodes. The first episode simply looked at your ability to put on muscle mass, how much muscle mass you can put on, and how fast you can do it. The second variable was simply your bone structure, primarily focusing on your shoulder to waist ratio. Third option was your muscle insertion. So, you know, you've got muscle, that's great, but how does it actually sit and attach on your skeletal frame? And the fourth and final option was body fat distribution. But guys, we're not done because secret variable number five, when I was composing these videos, I actually went back to the drawing board about last week and I discovered that there's one more thing I want to talk about. Body fat distribution will no longer be a score of 20, it's going to be a score of 10. And the remaining 10 points to get to 100 is going to be all about metabolism or the M score. Now I call this the metabolism score, but what I'm really referring to is how easy it is for an individual to get lean and then stay lean. We've all seen those individuals out there who are like, you know, oh, it's so difficult for me to, you know, get above like 10% body fat. These are the kind of individuals who was like, you know, they're cutting on like 3000 calories and eating like three, 350 grams of carbs and the fat is just flying off. Yeah, fuck those guys. And on the other hand, we have these somewhat unfortunate individuals. These are the kind of people who, you know, they just look at food and some, somehow, you know, they're just, they're just putting on body fat. Think of it this way. Let's say you were to go online into one of those you know, energy expenditure calculators. The ones where you plug in your, you know, your weight, uh, your age, your stats, your height, all that stuff. And then it spits out a number pretty much saying that, hey, if you eat this many calories, you will stay the same. And if you subtract 500 from that to get a 500 calorie deficit, and if you eat this many calories, then you should lose like, you know, like one pound of fat per week, you know, ideally. If you see that number and you think, yeah, that's about right, this formula was able to estimate me pretty well, then yeah, you probably have a somewhat average metabolism because you conform perfectly to our current metabolism estimation techniques. However, if you see this and you think, whoa, that is a lot more calories than I could handle, I need to go like two, three, 400 calories less than that number just to see weight loss, then you kind of got a little screwed and you might have a somewhat slower metabolism score. And so because of that, instead of being like a five you know, out of 10, being someone in the middle, you should maybe be a little bit down towards three, two, one, or zero. But enough talk because that's not the purpose of this video. No, this video I am finally really excited to say is not about learning. We've done all the conceptual theoretical stuff in the previous videos. Now it's time for some application. Now it's time to get into some examples. I've handpicked a few individuals who I think are gonna be really interesting to look at from a genetic standpoint. Most of these guys are from the fitness social media industry. We're talking Instagram and YouTube. And then a few of these guys are going to be just general action movie stars. But before we get started, I know you guys are excited. I am too. There are still four quick little rules I want to establish before we go any further with the examples. Number one is that this Guys, this is still very subjective. I've tried my best to make this a very quantitative model because I do feel that numbers don't lie. But in this case, some of these variables, you still have to assign a score. And whenever you're assigning a score as a judge, you know, what you might think is a 10 out of 10, someone out there might think is a seven out of 10. Number two is guys, if you are thinking about trying out my model, number one, awesome, you know, I implore you to do so. In fact, I wanna hear down in the comments below what you got. We're not trying to judge here or anything. I just, I just wanna hear from you guys and see what these, what the average numbers are. But one thing I will mention, do not attempt to do this until you have at least a few years of a training experience. If you are in the gym for four or five years, uh, you know, you're eating properly, you're training properly, you probably have a good idea of, you know, you're not at your genetic potential, but you're getting closer and closer. And you probably, you know, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. However, an individual who's been training, you know, kind of on and off half past for six months, they have no idea what they're talking about. If they can grow a certain part of their body, you know, their biceps or deltoids or whatever, they might think like, oh, it's my genetics. No, I mean, maybe, but we have no idea because you haven't put any actual time and effort into it. It's kind of like a race. For you to actually see the end of the race, you know, the finish line, you gotta be somewhat closer to it. If you're running a marathon and you're like two miles in, probably a little early for you to be like, all right, I think my time today is gonna be 
I have no idea how long an average marathon is. You get the picture. Third thing, another prerequisite I would recommend before attempting my genetic model, you should probably try to do this when you're somewhat lean. I mean, if you're like, you know, 18, 20% body fat, you're not obese or overweight, but you're not like, you know, lean with a six pack, you can still probably do it. But I do feel that the leaner you are, ideally, you know, 10, 12, maybe 15% body fat, a little bit of a six pack, somewhere around there, you know, no beer belly hanging over. This is going to make this genetic model a little bit more accurate. The reason behind this is because a lot of these variables can be skewed either up or down if you have an increased body fat percentage. A good example of this would be your shoulder to waist ratio. If your waist is wider, because not because you have a wide pelvis and a wide bone structure, which is what we're trying to analyze, but simply because you have an additional two or three inches of subcutaneous body fat around your waist, that's going to skew your score down and we wanna avoid that. And the fourth and final variable, actually, we're not gonna be talking about that yet. I wanna talk about that at the end of the video, so I will tune in with you guys afterwards, but in the meantime, this is where you guys are going to love me because I know that so many of you guys, this model is kind of annoying because there's so many calculations and so many numbers, and for you to actually sit here and get a score, it will take 30 minutes of you scribbling stuff. Don't worry. I got you covered. I have actually created a full Excel sheet, a full Excel, you know, a little model, which will do all the calculations for you. You can download it in the description box below. I left the link. You can open it up in your spreadsheet software, whether it be Microsoft Excel, Numbers, Google Docs. You just plug in your numbers, you know, height, weight, estimated body fat percentage, and it does all the calculations for you. That's right. You know, you don't have to thank me at all. There's nothing, nothing that you have to do for me in return. All right, enough of that. Seriously, examples, let's go now. All right, guys, so let's jump into a few examples and walk you through how I'm going to do this. The first example, I want to start off simply with me because, you know, I can talk the talk, but let's see if I can walk the walk. So right off the bat, my height is going to be, it's technically like 5'11 and three quarters, but fuck it, YOLO, six feet tall. 175 pounds is the weight I'm going to be going with in the photos that you guys are seeing on screen right now. Um, let's go with 9% body fat. I wish I could say eight, but I really want to stay conservative. And a lot of times people think they're a lot leaner than they actually are. So I'm going to go with 9%, I think is a relatively fair estimate. Now I've gone through and I've actually already done my wrist and ankle measurements. Next up, shoulder and waist width. You'll notice that it says any unit because this doesn't matter. It is a ratio. So you can use centimeters, pixels, rocket ships. I don't care. As long as the units are consistent, you are fine. So I've actually gone into Photoshop and I drew a line across my shoulders as best as I could and my waist. And then when I do that, it says kind of like on the line, it says centimeters or pixels or whatever. So in my case, this comes out to 5.75 and 3.32, which actually comes out to right here, which is a 1.73 shoulder to waist ratio, which is relatively average. It's not stupendous, but it's not necessarily um, terrible. Now, getting into the ab insertions, getting into the actual eye score, this is where it does get very subjective. So some of you guys are going to think I'm being too hard on myself. Some of you guys think that I'm being too easy on myself. That's okay. Worst case, I'm off by a few points. Ab insertions, it's sort of like a somewhat asymmetrical four packs. My chest is definitely not the best because one pec technically is bigger than the other and overall the shape is, again, my chest is not definitely one of my stronger fortes, unlike something like my back. Uh, biceps are relatively average. Uh, deltoid, same case. Body fat distribution, uh, I store a little bit more in my lower body, so whatever, not bad. And my metabolism is relatively normal. Sometimes I kind of complain that I have to like really dig down to my calories. Like I will know people who are technically smaller than me who can cut on 23, 2400 calories, whereas I have to get down to 2100-ish. But maybe it's not that I'm bad, it's just that those people have slightly faster metabolisms on average and they could and they could cut a little bit easier. Either way, this comes out to 52.5. And the really cool thing about this, guys, is that my entire life, I have always said that my genetics are relatively average. But it's crazy because now, independently, as I put these variables together and came up with this calculation, it seems like mathematically, I am actually really close to what I predicted. Literally 2.5 points away from dead on 50 out of 100 being technically kind of like the average so that's not bad let's move on to our next example all right guys next up we're going to be talking about david laid and one of the reasons why i wanted to include him on this list is because clearly he's an example of an individual spoiler alert probably going to score relatively high on my model but nonetheless let's jump into the numbers now he is six foot two and i found a recent instagram photo where he claimed 
Uh, he said his body weight is 210 pounds. And if you look at his actual body fat percentage in this photo, I mean, I'm going to have to estimate here, but let's be honest, he does not carry that much body fat. I'm just going to give him a nice score of 10%. He could probably easily get down lower to 6, 7, 8 if he wanted to. But I mean, it's not like he competes in like bodybuilding or men's physique shows or anything that I know of. So a nice and even a relatively conservative estimate, in my opinion, of 10% body fat, giving him an FFMI score of 24.26, which is really really damn high and i know right off the bat guys like i've seen the videos and i know what's gonna happen whenever you put guys like him into a video you're gonna get this like shit show in the comment section of like he's not even natural blah 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 i have no idea guys it's it's impossible to tell i've never met him i don't know him personally so the point of this video is not to discuss whether an individual is or isn't on any kind of performance enhancing drugs i don't know i don't really give a shit we are talking about your genetics here steroids aren't really going to influence things like for example your bone structure your or your insertions you're born with that and no amount of steroids is going to change that so for the purpose of this video if you guys want to bitch and argue about that in the comments below go ahead but i'm not really focusing on that but one thing that is kind of cool is that you guys know in my previous videos i mentioned that the higher higher your ffmi goes especially once it goes up to the 25 range and over it doesn't mean for sure obviously you're on steroids because there are plenty of people who are genetic freaks but it does become less and less likely a score of 24.26 means that you are a genetic anomaly but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be on steroids as if someone who had like a an FFMI score of like 30 or something and looks like a friggin' Mr. Olympia. So, I mean, obviously David looks incredible, but that doesn't mean 1000%. That's it. You're on steroids 100%. Again, I don't know. I'm not saying that. I'm not not saying that. I'm simply saying let's analyze his physique purely from the genetic standpoint. Next up, wrist and ankle uh, circumference. Now, obviously, I don't know what his actual measurements are, so I'm just going to have to estimate. I'm going to give him more or less average-ish uh, wrist and ankle measurements. A shoulder width, this is where it gets friggin' ridiculous. 6.30 for a shoulder, 3.15 centimeters for his waist. This comes out to an astonishingly high 2, like 2.0 shoulder to waist ratio, which is it is, I think it's the highest on our entire list. So right here, what you guys are seeing is a bone structure genetic freak. I mean, that's that's pretty much all it is. Next up, getting into the actual insertions. Everything on David is pretty damn good. Abs are really good, um, you know, relatively symmetrical six pack. His deltoids look like ridiculous. They look like little bowling balls or cannonballs or something. His chest looks fantastic. The only thing on his body in our genetic model, which isn't stupendous, is his biceps, which is relatively standard. It, very, it comes a lot when, uh, when you're dealing with taller guys. I always find that shorter guys have somewhat more compact and bigger looking uh, superior insertions. This is another reason why so many Mr. Olympias are usually 5'8", 5'9", 5'7", and under. There's not that many tall Mr. Olympias. Again, aside from Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think he's one out of like 13 guys. So body fat distribution in David's case is very good. He's lean all over. Nothing really stands out. And his metabolism is also a perfect 10 out of 10 score because the guy, I've never seen him above like 13, 14% body fat. And I've seen his videos on Instagram and stuff. And sometimes he actually talks about, if I remember correctly, and don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure he always talks about how it's not easy for him to gain weight. Sometimes when he goes on expos, he's like, all right, can't wait to like, you know, travel with Gymshark for a week and lose like 10 pounds. Like the fat just flies off of him. So definitely a faster metabolism, which again, kind of comes with the territory of being a younger and taller a taller guy. This gives him a final Vitruvian model of genetic score of 86, which is pretty goddamn high as uh, as I predicted. All right, guys, next on the docket, Christian Guzman, definitely a popular uh, example and someone who's going to be interesting to talk about because when you look at his physique, obviously it's good, but he doesn't necessarily look like a genetic freak, like in the case of David Lee, as we just saw. So let's see if my, uh, if my, my formulas or my model can analyze him and give us a relatively accurate example. So right off the bat, I believe Christian is about 5'11", maybe like 5'11", you know, and a half or something. I'm pretty sure at his most recent competition, he weighed 168 pounds. When he competes, he gets really, uh, really damn low in terms of his body weight. His estimated body fat percentage, I'm going to give him an 8% body fat. The guy does get lean. I mean, he's got this, you know, the six pack, the serratus, the everything, uh, the vascularity. The guy does get shredded. Um, his wrist and ankle circumference. Again, I do have to measure. I've stood next to the guy, actually. I've seen his physique. His wrist is relatively average. Um, he does, I think he is more of a natural ectomorph, but where it really shines is his ankles, which are pretty damn tiny. <laughs> he laughs about it, which is good. It's good when you can be humorous with yourself. Uh, definitely not gifted in the calf department, but again, 
Uh, bone structure is something that you can't really change. You just got to accept it. Uh, going to the shoulder to waist ratio, uh, 8.32, 4.74. This comes out to a shoulder to waist ratio of a relatively average 1.76. Good, but not necessarily, you know, overly genetically gifted. A relatively average person who works out and has some good lateral deltoid development. Getting into his insertions, abs are good, but not stupendous. Uh, chest is pretty good. I would say that uh, Christian's chest is definitely one of his better uh, better body parts it's not perfect squares like you'd like you know in the ideal pecs like something out of like Arnold Schwarzenegger however they you know he has very good equal development in terms of his upper and lower pectoral areas his biceps are really damn good he's got like a pretty good uh, bicep peaks in addition to having very little actual amount of tendon in his bicep which means more muscle less tendon as opposed to those um, those high uh, tendon high insertions uh, deltoids are pretty damn good especially because christian uh, again i think he really focuses a lot more on things like the squat and things like the bench press i've never seen him do anything ridiculous like you know really prioritizing something like the overhead press or the dumbbell shoulder press so to develop really amazing deltoids like this without having a crazy focus like he does for example on his on his squat because i know that he really has tried to build up and has succeeded in building up his quads over the last uh, last couple of years so the point is if he's built a pretty damn good set of shoulders like this without really training them like a freaking like really prioritizing them uh pretty damn good congratulations to him on body fat distribution next variable uh pretty damn good i mean his legs are lean his abs are lean nothing really stands out there isn't really a, like a uh, like a lagging body part in terms of body fat distribution when he cuts down and similar to david late his metabolism is crazy i mean he literally will talk about how it's difficult for him to put on weight and i'm pretty sure there was like a physique update he did not too long ago when he's like oh this is the heaviest i've ever been and i think it was like it, it was like what like 188 186 it, it wasn't anything drastic i'm about to give you guys a uh, physique update at about 188 190 189 pounds he cuts down the fat just melts off i have seen it happen so it's pretty damn good this gives him an overall Vitruvian model of genetic score. I gotta, you know, I'm just gonna keep on, I'm just gonna say genetic score because that's getting a little bit repetitive. 66.5, which is, uh, it's good. It's not like overly genetically gifted. It is a little bit better than average. It is, it is like, you know, relatively higher than what I had, if I remember correctly. But what this says is like, look, he's got a good body. He was obviously, you know, you know, he's gonna succeed when it comes to fitness. And you have to have at least, at least above average genetics if you wanna compete and actually win and compete at a high level when it comes to things like bodybuilding or men's physique shows or build a career off it. Let's be honest, like it really does help to have that. But the, the interesting thing is in his case is because Christian has done an amazing, um, he's made an amazing life in terms of fitness and in terms of his success, but he's done it without ridiculous, overly amazing genetics. Like someone who had, you know, if they had a score of 90, it'd be like, holy shit, do you, even, you don't even need to go to the gym because you, you just look incredible. So 66.5, good job on him. All right, guys, next up, let's move away from the fitness industry. I want to include more just regular people, you know, action stars, movie stars, somebody who everybody knows about and everybody can recognize. Let's look at Sylvester Stallone back in the 70s and 80s, the prime of the old school action hero era. His height, if I remember correctly, I looked up online, it was 5 foot 10 inches or 178 centimeters. His weight was about 175 in the photos you are seeing here. He, you know, he obviously varied between 175 to as high as something like 190 in later movies when he was a little bit, a little bit heavier. But in this photo, which I believe was around the time of Rambo 1, he was 175 pounds, which makes sense because the guy is shredded. I mean, this looks like a, this isn't just an action star. This is like literally, you can step on stage as a bodybuilder, uh, estimated body fat percentage. The guy is lean. I would say as low as like, you know, seven or maybe in my video, I'm going to say 8%. Wrist and ankle measurements. I have no idea, unfortunately, but he looks like a relatively average guy, five foot 10, nothing overly massive his shoulder to waist ratio 7.22 to 4.34 comes out to 1.66 which is actually not it's actually a little bit below average compared to the previous examples we've used christian and myself and obviously david late so you know the guy is not right off the bat he's not overly superiorly genetically gifted which is good because now we can actually get more into regular people as opposed to looking like you know, at like genetic monsters in the fitness industry, which it really is at the end of the day, a very biased uh, sample. Next up is insertions. Abs are relatively uh, pretty damn good. They're not perfectly, uh, you know, built. It's a little bit asymmetrical. His bicep insertions, relatively average. They're obviously nothing overly stupendous, not much of a bicep peak. In terms of his deltoids, they are pretty good, but again, nothing special. 
Um, body fat distribution is, it's actually kind of like mine. He stores a little bit more body fat in his lower body, as you'll see in this photo. I mean, here you can see his abs, his serratus, he looks shredded, but then his legs look like they're lagging like 5% in terms of body fat behind his actual upper body. So again, not, you know, not bad or anything, but it, it's kind of similar to me, which is good. I am, uh, I am not alone. Uh, getting into his metabolism, assuming that he's a regular individual, someone who loses and gains weight, you know, as, as they eat, nothing, nothing overly dramatic in either, you know, towards either end of the spectrum, this gives him a final score of 57.5. And this is pretty good because the thing is, it shows that this person is relatively average, you know, anywhere in that 50 to 60 range is a relatively average individual by my standards. And he still built an incredible body. And not just the body, he's built an incredible career focusing on physicality in terms of athleticism with Rocky and just badass gun muscle crazy masculinity shit when it comes to Rambo. So the point is the guy has built a career over very physical characters displaying that physical, uh, you know, that, that perfect body. When, re when reality, his body isn't perfect by the standards of genetics. All right, guys, next example. Let's get back into the fitness industry. We're going to be talking about Marine, otherwise known as formerly known as Student Aesthetics. This guy has, a, you know, built a fantastic physique, which is good because now we're getting more into slightly taller guys. I have always said that shorter guys, I think they do, they tend to be a little bit thicker in terms of their, like, overall, you know, they look a little bit stockier, but it always seems like they can put on muscle mass quite well. So it's good. I think Marine is about 6'1", maybe 6'1 and a half. Uh, he comes out to his weight was 181.4 pounds in this picture you guys are seeing right now, which comes from his Instagram not too long ago. I think it's like maybe a few weeks, maybe a few months. Estimated body fat percentage. The guy is lean here, but it's not like it's not like he's doing a photo shoot or competing or anything. So I'm going to give him a nice 10% body fat. Again, give or take a percent. Um, his wrist and ankle circumference, again, I don't know. I'm going to give him more, more or less average scores. His shoulder to waist ratio comes out to 1.66, which again, isn't... It's actually a little bit below average according to my calculations, but Ryan has always been a bit more, he has more of like, instead of like a bodybuilder look, in my opinion, he has more of like a fitness model look, something that you'd see on a magazine, like Greg Plitt had this kind of look going on, and obviously he had a uh, fantastic example, but again, the shoulder to waist ratio is around 1.66. Uh, his ab insertions are very good, uh, six pack, somewhat asymmetrical, uh, his chest is okay. I would say that his chest is not as genetically gifted as, for example, other people we saw previously in this video, such as someone like Christian Guzman or David Laid. In fact, if you were to compare his chest to his deltoids, what's interesting is they're kind of the same size. And I've seen him train. He works out his chest hard. It's just simply in terms of the way it sits on his body. I mean, don't, it's, not, you know, it's not bad or anything, don't get me wrong, but it's not as gifted as something like his deltoids, which in my opinion are, his shoulders are friggin' massive, they are crazy, and I've trained with him, he's a strong guy, but it's crazy to train with someone who's relatively similar in terms of like pushing strength when it comes to shoulders and chest and stuff, but then his deltoids just blow me out of the water, I'm like, holy shit, uh, bicep insertions are relatively average, you know, again, taller guys, it's kind of hard to build incredible uh, biceps or just in general, most muscle insertions, at least from what I've seen in my personal experience. Body fat distribution is pretty damn good. He loses body fat, you know, normally his abs are lean, his chest is lean, his legs are lean, nothing really lags behind. And metabolism, I think it's kind of in between fast and average. Like I've seen him talk, uh, I think this is one video where he talked about when he, when he cuts down, if he cuts down too hard, he does have to really decrease his calories and it does start to suck. Like he will start to feel negative repercussions. And that's indicative of someone who, you know, if they really want to get lean, they're going to have to really, you know, work really hard. The difference between losing fat and losing weight, because when you talk about weight, you can also lose muscle mass, all right? And therefore your weight lowers down. And that is actually what happened to me last year when I got even leaner than I did this year, all right? And I'm in that process. I actually got health issues as well. As opposed to someone who's like, oh, I want to get lean, please. I just, I just cut my meal intake from 10 pizzas a day down to nine pizzas a day. Point is, Ryan works hard to cut down, so that's why I think his metabolism is, give or take, somewhat, uh, somewhat average. Giving him a final uh, genetic score of 59. Again, pretty good, um, but nothing overly stupendous. Again, anywhere in that like 45, 50, maybe 50 to 60 range, I would say is a relatively a normal individual. All right, guys, let's have some fun. Let's look at a really cool example. The king of bodybuilding, Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is going to be an interesting example. Now, right off the bat, it's no surprise. Arnold is not, you know, uh, foreign to vitamin S supplementation, if you get what I mean. Steroids are taken uh, eight or nine, ten weeks before a competition. It's not a healthy thing to do, but uh, it, it's being used. Did you, did you take them? I take them. I took them, yeah, up until the competition. We, we talked about it very openly. 
I mean, anyone that was asked, says, you take steroids? Says, yeah, I take three Dianabol a day. These results are definitely going to be skewed upward, especially in terms of things like his FFMI score. However, the one thing I do want to mention, you can't become a world champion and a Mr. Olympia without having some pretty goddamn good genetics. Like if you were to take the best natural bodybuilder in the world and you were to jack him up on steroids, over the course of a few years, you'd probably turn into the world's best overall bodybuilder. It's just good genetics are good genetics. And, you know, steroids simply opened the door for you to go further. And Arnold took it to the very end. That's why even taking, you know, the whole performance enhancing steroid drug thing out of the equation, I'm pretty sure he would still look. he look like a smaller version of this, but he'd still look pretty damn incredible. And he'd still score very highly on my genetic model score. That being said, six foot two, 235 pounds. This is what he... These are the actual measurements from Pumping Iron, which everyone knows him from his 1975 Mr. Olympia win. Estimated body fat percentage of probably around, you know, give or take 10%. Like, it's weird. These guys got lean, but they never got overly lean. I mean, you might take it as low as something like 8% body fat, in which case his FFMI would go up to 28. But it doesn't really matter because his muscle mass score is already a perfect 30 out of 30. Um, wrist and ankle circumference measurements. I'm going to give him really high numbers. Arnold was a big fucking dude. He wasn't one of those kind of like taller, lanky guys. He was, he, everybody knew he was going to go up to be a big freaking dude. In terms of his shoulder to waist ratio, not surprisingly, it is 1.81, which is good. It's significantly above average, and you kind of expect that from a former Mr. Olympia. In terms of his insertions, his abs were not bad. His chest was absolutely incredible, in my opinion, probably one of the best chests of all time, both due to a combination of nutrition, training, and let's be honest, genetics. Uh, his biceps also, same thing, probably some of the best biceps I've ever seen in my entire life. Massively high bicep peaks, very little actual tendon, just very big full muscle bellies. Body fat distribution was fantastic. He had lean legs, lean abs, lean everything, nothing really lagged behind. Finally, in terms of his metabolism, this is kind of an interesting case because although I am tempted to say it's a perfect 10 out of 10 because the, I've never seen him, you know, have any significant body fat, I don't think it was overly easy for him to get lean. In fact, when Arnold was younger, I believe when he was like 20, 21, I believe it was the 1966 Mr. Universe. This is like, I think one of two or three competitions that he has ever lost. Literally, like I can count them on one hand. He lost to Chet Yorton and he actually lost this specifically. I remember reading this from his autobiography. He said that one of the reasons he lost was because although Arnold was bigger, Chet simply had a more defined physique. You can see his quads, you can see his abs. At the end of the day, pretty much, I think this is one of the really first examples where it wasn't just about being big and having mass. It was about having quality and having good conditioning. And Arnold technically lost to someone who was more or less the same size or maybe a little bit smaller simply due to the fact that this guy was leaner, proving that Arnold Schwarzenegger was not perfect. And he did, in the beginning a little bit, have issues with uh, getting sufficiently lean. And then obviously once he fixed that, it was just, you know, seven years Six of those being, you know, in a row in terms of consecutive Mr. Olympia uh, wins. This gives him a final overall score of 87. Not surprisingly, Arnold Schwarzenegger so far is the highest score on our entire list. And you know what? That kind of comes to the territory of being a seven-time Mr. Olympia. Final guy on our list, Jeff Nippert. A lot of you guys know him. Uh, informative, uh, fitness, YouTuber, fantastic physique. One of the reasons why I want to include him on this list is to show you the genetics of someone who can be a little bit shorter. I believe Jeff is about five foot five, so he's definitely not the tallest guy. So we're going to see how that actually affects his genetic score and whether or not it has, has any impact on that. In my opinion, it, it kind of does. So five foot five, um, his weight at his leanest, he was like 15 pounds lower means he was about 159 pounds and his body fat percentage, which I would say in this photo is I'm estimating it's around 10% body fat lean, but it's not like he's stepping on stage or anything. Shoulder to waist ratio is 1.81. And I think mostly this comes not necessarily because he's got a tiny waist, but because he's got very big uh, shoulders. And this is where the short guy kind of thing comes in. And in terms of insertions, I have found in my personal experience that a lot of shorter guys will have very, very good, very like round, circular, bulky, um, muscle insertions. Think of someone like, like again, like Jeff or like uh, Matt Ogus is a very good example of this. I mean, like these really round deltoids and very good, like thick bicep and chest insertions. And again, these are why so many Mr. Olympias are like five, eight, five, nine, five, seven, um, and under. Finally, when it comes to his body fat distribution score, Jeff is an interesting example. I think he may be the only guy on this list who has a little bit more of a mix and match when it comes to body fat distribution. He's got relatively lean, you know, chest 
arms, legs are not bad, all that stuff is there. But it's interesting, in a lot of his photos, even when he's very, very lean, even when he's like competition lean, he still holds a little bit more body fat in terms of his abdominal area. This is very common for men. Men tend to hold more body fat in their midsection. Women tend to hold more body fat in their lower bodies. So it just goes to show you how everybody is built somewhat differently. And finally, when it comes to his metabolism, I'm not 100% sure on this, but based on what I have seen in terms of his vlogs and his videos and his general social media content, I think his actual metabolism seems to be relatively average. He doesn't gain or lose weight necessarily, you know, he's not really towards any side of the spectrum. This gives him an overall final genetic score of 65.5. Technically a little bit above average, but you know, again, give or take a few points because this is always going to be relatively subjective. And finally, guys, the last thing I want to mention before I close out this video, rule number four, which I saved all the way until now, you know, something which I think may be the most important rule of all. Do not use genetics as an excuse to give up. To explain, there's pretty much three things that I think you have to remember in order to use this video in a positive way manner or positive standpoint. Number one, don't compare yourself to someone who got a genetic score of 80 if you got a genetic score of 40 because you are only setting yourself up to feel like crap. Rule number two, do not excuse the hard work of others who may be somewhat more genetically gifted. Let me make this perfectly clear. Everybody up on stage at the Mr. Olympia, the top 10 bodybuilders in the world, all of their genetics are incredible. All of these guys are probably like 90 out of 10 on my genetic model. But each of those guys probably had to like torture themselves to get there. Same case with the NBA. You know, if you're incredible and you're good at basketball and you're like six foot eight, you, you know, welcome to the NBA. Everybody's like that. You're one out of like a thousand individuals. You're the top 1000 in the world, but still, whether you like to admit it or not, hard work is still an absolutely invaluable and essential component to an individual success, regardless of their genetics. And finally, the third and last thing I wanna mention, if you are not genetically gifted, do not let that be an excuse. If you go through my model and you get something like, you know, in the 30 or 40, essentially below 50, below even average range, and you think that's it, you know, I'm never gonna succeed, I'm never gonna have the body that I want, I'm never gonna look like him or her or whatnot, I should just give up. That is bullshit. Yes, I'm gonna give you some tough love. If you are not genetically gifted, if you're, you know, potentially even below average, you'll probably never look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You will probably never be in the NBA, or you'll never be in the NFL, you'll never be like, you know, one of the best people who can end up on stage or in magazines or whatnot. You know what, fuck it, who cares? Welcome to the other 99% of the world. What you can still do is work your ass off and get to a point where in the future, you have improved so much that you make yourself now look like shit. So guys, at the end of the day, a few parting words. Let me close out this video and close out this, you know, this series once and for all. My you know, my words of advice, words of inspiration to you are very simple and very beautiful, I might add. Sit down, shut the fuck up, pick up something heavy, and then repeat the process. You know, for like eight or ten years. Hadouken!